Good morning everyone and welcome to our service this morning. It's uh, good to know that there are folk listening in and we know that very often there are people from outside East Leap listening to and you are also welcome uh, to join with us in worshipping the living God. Our preacher this morning is Stephen Green. Stephen uh, lives near Leicester and works with Reach Across and he's going to tell us something about their work during the service this morning. Next week our service will be led by Stephen Cooper from Grace Church in Loughborough and I think that's all I need to tell you at this stage so I'll now hand over to Stephen for him to lead us in worship. Thank you Stephen. Good morning. It's great to be able to share with you folk from East League and perhaps more widely too. Can I bring you greetings from Odeby Evangelical Church and also the mission organisation that I represent, Reach Across, and more about that later. Last Wednesday, I don't know whether you were aware, it was um, Ascension Day when many Christians throughout the world remember that 40 days after the resurrection, our Lord Jesus Christ returned to the Father, his work on earth completed. What's he doing now? Well, the Apostle John tells us in Revelation 19, verse 6, in his vision of heaven, that he's sovereignly ruling the universe. A voice came from heaven saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For the Lord God Almighty reigns. So let us join with that multitude and, and let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts before you and your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, blessed Trinity. We thank you that we can draw near to you because Jesus Christ poured out his blood on the cross for our sins. He's made us clean. We thank you that he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. We feel our smallness. We feel our weakness. But you're a mighty king. Help us now to come near to you and to adore you with reverent joy, we pray in the name of King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, let's join together and, and sing our first hymn, shall we? It's number 54, if you have a hymn book to hand, The Lord is King. The author of this hymn, Josiah Condor, was born in 1789 and he lost his right eye at the age of five. It was due to a bad smallpox vaccination. But the Lord opened his spiritual eyes and saved his soul. He became an author and publisher, including the Congregational Hymnal. And in this hymn, he encourages us not to distrust his care nor murmur at his wise decrees, nor doubt his royal promises, but rather speak his praise. Let's sing number 54, The Lord is King. Yeah. 
Shall we draw near to God again in prayer? Let's pray. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Lord, we thank you that you're building your church throughout the world. The gates of hell cannot prevail against what you're doing. By your love, you're conquering the hearts of men and women and girls and boys and saving them. Thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. We ask you please to lift the veil of darkness from the eyes of Muslims everywhere. Cause them to despair of their religion of works as they come to the end of Ramadan and seek the Lord while he may be found. Please would you watch over your servants in Reach Across and other missions who are persevering in hard places and bring fruit for their labours. Lord, we pray that in these difficult days we would be your witnesses wherever we can be, that we'd always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks us for the reason, for the hope that lies within us. Do it with gentleness and respect. Please would you be with those in this congregation who are struggling in any way because of the virus. If any are sick, please Lord, would you heal them and raise them up again to serve you. If any are struggling, Financially, please supply their needs. If any are worried about their jobs or their children or their grandchildren, whether or not they should go back to school, grant them wisdom and peace. Pray that you will reveal to our country's leaders what to do for the best. Would you cause them to look to you for wisdom and guidance. But please have mercy on us and deliver us from this pestilence. Help our country to recover as a nation, Lord, so that we might be able to say that indeed righteousness exalts our nation. Please would you give the leaders of our churches wisdom to know how to respond for the best, how to change if that's what we need. When to start meeting again and, and where? Lord, please would you provide for your people here all the pastoral care that they need now and in the future. We confess, Lord, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Lord, we acknowledge that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We thank you that Jesus... Thy blood and righteousness, my beauty, are my glorious dress. Midst flaming worlds in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. Lord, I understand that on this day, May the 24th, is the very day in 1738 when John Wesley read the word of God in Romans and his heart was strangely warmed and he trusted in Christ alone, not his good works, and then he was born again. Lord, we pray now, as we read the scriptures, you would warm our hearts and, and sanctify us by your word, because your word is truth. And then as we hear it explained, 
that we would be doers of that word to the glory of our King Jesus. Amen. Now our Bible reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 14 through to 34. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. People were all amazed that they asked each other, so amazed they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who were ill and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts. Well, our second hymn, number 41, continues our theme of Jesus' kingship and authority. Verse 2 says, Come thou incarnate word, Gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless, and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness, on us descend. It's in 41. Come thou almighty King.
If you have a Bible, please turn with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 14 to verse 34. How do you know who to believe and who to obey? It must be very difficult at this time for parents to know whose instructions to follow. The government's recommending you send your children to school or teachers saying, not so fast. The government is saying, we must all follow the science during this pandemic, but whose science? Now, some of us have a more compliant temperament and we like being told what to do. But there is built in to every human being a natural resistance to authority that began in the Garden of Eden when Adam chose not to obey God and listen to the voice of Satan. That's basically why the world is in a mess. But Mark's gospel tells us not to lose hope. Right at the beginning of Mark, in the first verse, it says, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, or the promised deliverer, the Son of God. It's saying that God is in charge. He sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. Mark tells us how he did that by going to the cross and dying for us. So here in Mark chapter 1, he sets the scene for us and tells us why God is pleased with Jesus and shows us why we should believe that Jesus Christ must take charge of our lives. So in this passage, I'd like us to see four, four things. First, the Lord Jesus tells you what you must believe. Second, the Lord Jesus calls you where you must serve. Third, the Lord Jesus commands his enemies. And fourth, the Lord Jesus controls your destiny. So firstly then, the Lord Jesus tells you what you must believe. Look at verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So what right did Jesus have to tell people what to do? Well, because he was sent from God. Just as the Holy Spirit sent Jesus into the wilderness in verse 12, so he was on a God-authorised mission to Galilee. His authority didn't come from being an expert in the Old Testament law, though he knew it back to front and he kept it perfectly in his heart. It was clear to everybody who heard him that he was special. Verse 21, they went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So he knew what he was talking about. He believed what he taught. And his authority came from submitting to his father's will. It meant he was willing to be sent into the wilderness to be trained and tested in all points like us yet without sin. It meant he needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 11, so he possessed spiritual power as a man. And by the way, any of you who want to be used by God to tell others about God, you'll need both those things. First, training and testing, learning the word of God, learning to pray, being put through difficult times to make you resilient and compassionate. But you'll also need to be filled with the Spirit so that you depend on God and not on yourself. Ryan Edwards put it in his book, Nothing But the Truth. A church without authority is like a crocodile without teeth. It can open its mouth as wide and as often as it likes, but who cares? So what was the response 
of the people to Jesus teaching well it says amazement the English Standard Version translates it astonished that English word astonish is itself derived from the Latin word externare which means to strike with thunder and the original Greek word has the idea of being knocked out or stunned to the point of being overwhelmed but you know it's awfully possible to be amazed without being persuaded to do anything about it isn't this especially true in our age of fantastic natural history programs on TV remember the time you used to like everybody's Facebook photos and, and Twitter quotations now they have to be really good before we stop and give them a thumbs up well you can't say who cares when it comes to Jesus the response that Jesus is looking for is to be moved to do what he says to repent and believe the good news so let your thinking be changed by Jesus believe what he says is true how do you know what to believe well Jesus said I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me and believe what he's going to say in chapter 2 and verse 10 I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins will you trust him to do that for you and then let him take control of your life but secondly the Lord Jesus calls you where you must serve verse 16 as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen come follow me Jesus said and I will send you out to fish for people traditionally translated and make you fishers of men and at once they left their nets and followed him now these weren't just any old fishermen one source said that there was many as 300 boats trying to make a living on Lake Galilee it's not that Simon and Andrew James and John were anything out of the ordinary working men in Galilee we don't know why Jesus handpicked them but he has the authority to choose who will be his disciples and if you compare it with the other Gospels you'll understand that they have already responded to the preaching of John the Baptist they've had a whole year to listen to Jesus and watch him and learn from him so it wasn't a leap in the dark for them to follow him they thought deeply about his teaching and his life so when Jesus said come they followed him at once and that word occurs seven times in Mark and the synonym immediately that occurs uh, 11 times and this is typical of the gospel of Mark it, it's fast moving it's as if he's saying this is what happened these are the facts bang 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 now what are you going to do about it and they must have thought this isn't going to be easy to leave our father's fishing business fishing is hard enough but the fishing Jesus was calling them to was going to be a life of sacrifice of opposition from men they didn't understand everything that would face them in the years ahead but because Jesus had called them they immediately had to follow I often think of the RNLI boatmen the lifeboat men when they get a message on their pager they don't fully know what they're going to face when they launch their boat but they know they're going to be involved in the wonderful work of saving people's lives so they drop everything and they run to the lifeboat station but what about people in the world whose souls are in danger and at the end of Mark's gospel in chapter 16 and um, verse 19 it says he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God that's the ascension again isn't it so the God man 
Jesus is on the throne and he's in charge and he sends his disciples out to spread the good news. And it's the equivalent of Matthew's closing verses. Remember, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. There's still a need to hear Christ's call to go to the nations, starting as witnesses here in your Jerusalem and then to the ends of the earth. And if you can't go, well then give. And I think you can pray. Thirdly then, the Lord Jesus commands his enemies. It's significant, I think, that at every important advance in Jesus' own ministry, the devil is there opposing it. As soon as Jesus was baptised, the devil was ready with every trick in his book to tempt him to give up. And so here, as soon as Jesus has called disciples to go on the road with him, more and more people want to listen to his teaching. The devil lobs a fear grenade into the congregation to try and sow confusion and doubt. Verse 23. Just then, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit or a demon cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Suggesting that there might have been more than one demon. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. And that's interesting in the context of our subject, isn't it? This impure spirit or, or demons that have taken possession of a man and has authority over this man's life actually recognise the higher authority of Jesus. They know he is the Holy One of God and suspect he has power to destroy them. And yet there are many people today who say, oh yeah, I believe in God, but I don't want to take it to any extreme. I don't want it to take over my life. None of this believing in the spirits and, and the devil and preaching and so on. It's enough to do your best, isn't it? To be a good citizen. Be kind to everyone. Well, the Apostle James reminds us in James 2 verse 19, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. But Jesus is the Son of God. He's God King. He does have the authority to command his enemies. In fact, John says in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So in verse 25, Jesus takes charge. Be quiet, Jesus says sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. It's a wonderful thing when you have the power to do good. Absolute power in the right hands is wonderful. Jesus had compassion on this man and released him from whatever demons and hold was on him. Be quiet, he said to them. It's actually the word that's used to muzzle an animal so it can't bite you. We might paraphrase Jesus' words. Shut it. Hebrews 11 tells us he, he shuts the mouths of lions so they can't ultimately harm us and, and therefore shouldn't scare us. Two things I want you to realize from this. Number one, we mustn't underestimate the power of God's enemies. These uh, demons had a terrible hold on this man, so much so that he shook violently when they came out. The word for shriek that's used in verse 25 is literally a loud voice. We get our word megaphone from it. So don't think that you can just breeze into situations where the devil is clearly entrenched, whether that's overseas, where there's idol worship, or even in our country, where there might be addictions or, or abuse. 
because you think you'll be immune from attack or harm. No, you, you need to know you have the authority of God, that you go in the name of Jesus like he was, filled with the Holy Spirit. But secondly, we, we mustn't overestimate the power of God's enemies. The people might have initially been terrified by, by that demonic megaphone. But look carefully at verse 27. The people were all so amazed, they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obeyed him. And the word amazed there is a different word to the one in verse 21. It has the idea of being disturbed or distraught or even terrified. In other words, they were in awe of Jesus because they realised the demons spoke some truth. Jesus is the Holy One of God. <clears throat> we're soon entering the season of Pentecost. Oh, that we would know something of those days in the early church when Luke says in Acts 5, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. All the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade and no one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Ultimately, of course, Jesus has authority over our last enemy, which is death. Remember, Jesus said to John, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. 17th century Scottish minister Samuel Rutherford was summoned by the king to answer charges of treason, almost certainly to be publicly burned. But he knew he was dying, and actually he did die on the journey to the summons. But before this, when he, when he was told that messengers were coming to serve that summons, he said this, Tell them, I have a summons from a higher judge, a higher court, and will soon be where few kings and great ones come. What trust in God. And that ought to be our response as well. Fourthly, the Lord Jesus controls your destiny. What does the future hold for our country, for, for our world, for my family? What if I catch COVID-19? What if I get made redundant? What if someone from my family catches it? And I wonder if even in the midst of those awesome days in Galilee, Peter's thoughts turned to home. What's going to happen to my mother-in-law? Well, he needn't have feared because verse 29 says, As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. Actually, the word is begged. It was that urgent. As soon as they left the synagogue, it says, Jesus is busy on his father's business, on his way to demonstrate his authority over sickness and, and death as well. He's got no fear of whatever disease it might be that's causing the fever. By the way, where are the so-called faith healers today? Why are they so quiet during this pandemic? Why aren't they going into hospitals and laying hands on people and healing them? Because they're scared of catching the virus themselves, aren't they? They wouldn't be allowed anyway. And because they don't have Jesus' authority to claim power over sickness. And it's a fact. God does not always heal us in this life. Some of us are going to get COVID-19. Joni Erickson Tarder, who herself has been a quadriplegic for 50 years since the teenage diving accident, she writes, sometimes sickness 
serves as God's chastisement to wake us from our sin. But the Lord Jesus has authority over these things. He has authority over every microbe of this pandemic. The Puritan Thomas Manton wrote, Sickness is God's messenger to call us to meet with God. Surely what this last incident tells us is that Jesus not only has authority over these things, he has compassion for us and our loved ones. He says, so he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. He touched her. He helped her. He healed her. I can't promise that God will heal you now or in the future, but I can promise that he'll help you. On the cross, Jesus did bear all our sins and all our diseases. One day the whole of creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay when Jesus' kingdom finally comes on earth. Revelation 21 verse 5, John tells us, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. So finally, what should our response be to this? Well, firstly, the Lord Jesus controls our destiny. He's offering you now forgiveness and healing and heaven and a relationship with him now, today. So you need to bow the knee to him. You need to accept his forgiveness and terms of peace. You need to allow him to be the ruler of your life. He'll sort you out. He's not at all bossy. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. But secondly, your response should be to serve him. Notice. Simon's mother-in-law immediately began to wait on them, humbly doing what she could to serve in Christ's kingdom. Ask Jesus, Lord, what do you want me to do? How can my life be used to make your name great? How can I promote your great mission of saving the nations? What, what career shall I follow to, to further this? What husband or wife will you choose for me or not? Start by doing what Simon did after church, after synagogue. Take Jesus home with you and live the rest of your life serving King Jesus. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son, our Lord Jesus, to be our Redeemer and our Lord. Thank you that he humbled himself even to the cross. Thank you that you raised him from the dead and he is now seated at your right hand, ruling and reigning. We bow the knee to him. Lord, how may we serve you in this world? Please fill us with your spirit so that we can do that and send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask it for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, our closing hymn is number 544. If you have a book, it's written by the late Vernon Chaim. So this morning, if we've heard the sweet and merciful voice, of the Lord Jesus, if we trusted in his death on the cross for our sins and, and felt our hearts strangely warmed, like uh, John Wesley, 
there may be also hear and feel that compulsion to go into the world to be his witnesses. And the 544, have you heard the voice of Jesus? So may God bless you today. Thank you for joining us. If there are any listening to this and you need some kind of help, you can find contact details on the church website and you can even leave a message there and someone will get back to you. Do also feel free to contact me, if you like, via Reach Across. Now may I commend you all to God with these words. To him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>